Hear the word of God from Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 27. This reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version and may be found on pages 857 and 858 in the Pew Bible. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I suspect that there are some folks in the sanctuary this morning or watching online that if they were to do an honest assessment of themselves, they would admit that they have a problem with low self-esteem, that they perhaps think of themselves much too lowly than they actually are. I also suspect that there may be a different group of people here today who have the opposite problem that perhaps they see themselves much too highly with an inflated self-esteem. But I'm pretty much convinced that most of us here today have a problem with both, that we actually vacillate between the two, between either seeing ourselves much too lowly or even much too highly. So the question that I would have for you is, how do we see ourselves realistically. The humor novelist Chuck Bahalnyuk once said, the difference between how you look and how you see yourself is enough to kill most people. And maybe the reason vampires don't die is because they can never see themselves in photographs or mirrors. I think there's wisdom in that. How is it that we might see ourselves most realistically? neither as much too low or much too high. And the truth of the matter is, the Bible is filled with lots of stories of some of the greatest heroes in the biblical narrative, folks who looked at themselves much too lowly. I think the chief example of this is Moses. You've heard of Moses. We first meet him in the book of Exodus. And here he is, probably the furthest thing from your mind, from being a prince in Pharaoh's palace, let alone the liberator of the Israelite people. Here he is, wandering in the wilderness, a stuttering, stammering, fugitive from the law, when all of a sudden, out of the blue, God appears to him in the form of a burning bush and says, Moses, I've got a job for you. I want you to march into Pharaoh's palace, and I want you to tell that guy to let my people go. To which Moses says, you got to be kidding me. God, are you sure you're not talking through the wrong bush? Have you heard me speak in public lately? I sound worse than Vicky. <laughs> not, not that Vicky sounds bad, but at least she's not stuttering or stammering. I mean, Moses saw himself much too lowly. Think about David. David. Who would have known that in such a pint-sized frame of a shepherd boy would beat the heart of a king of Israel? Certainly not his brothers, not even his own father, the last person in the world they would have thought to be the great and mighty king of the Israelite empire would have been this pint-sized kid. And I can imagine David standing there in recess at school when all of the other boys were doing a schoolyard pick for teams and the two captains were picking one boy after another, picking the brawny ones and the tough ones, and then the unfortunate captain at the end had a glum look on his face when he said, oh man, I guess we'll take David. Because that's pretty much what happened when the prophet Samuel showed up. You know that story. 
He was on a search. He was conducting a, a, an episode of American Idol, Israelite King edition, when he goes to the family of Jesse and says, one of your boys is going to be the next king of Israel, let's see them. And he goes one by one, one brother after another, the tough ones, the tall ones, the brawny ones, the good-looking ones. And all of a sudden, he's out of boys, and he says to Jesse, don't you have any other boys left? And Jesse says, yeah, but you're not thinking of that one, are you? And then look at the disciples. The disciples in the Gospels, in this wonderful, rich story that Susan just read for you in Luke 22, these very same disciples who relatively came out of obscurity into the wide scope of the Gospel, I mean, you couldn't imagine, you couldn't pick a more ragtag, ordinary bunch of folks than these people, people who were plucked from obscurity. Some of them were fishermen, some of them were tax collectors, and we don't even know what the other ones did. The Gospels don't even tell us the jobs that the other disciples had. They probably were so common, so ordinary, that the Gospels didn't even bother telling us what the other ones did. You see, time and time again, the Bible tells us that God loves to pick people who didn't think highly enough of themselves to possibly make any kind of difference in the kingdom, but God picks people one right after another whom God sees much more highly than they see themselves. Now, Debbie and Justin last week did a good job preaching on this topic about how you can see yourself the way God sees you, so that even though you might focus on your limitations and your weaknesses and see yourself much too lowly, Hopefully, you gained out of that service an idea that God sees you with so much more potential and so much more possibility that if you were simply to say yes, then you might experience God's love unleashed in you and through you, regardless of how lowly you see yourselves. And hopefully, that was a good word for you, but I suspect there's another word here today because as is often the case, We not only see ourselves too lowly, but we swing that pendulum so far to the other side that we discover there is just as many problems if we view ourselves too highly. You want an example? Well then, just look at those same three folks that I lifted up before, beginning with Moses. That very same Moses, that stuttering, stammering, frightened guy. After many years of leading the Israelite people and successfully liberating them from Pharaoh, he started to think of himself pretty highly. In fact, he started to think of himself as kind of a big deal, to the point where one day he started to act as if he were God and not just following God. He took that stick, that famous walking stick, that that staff through which God had performed miracle after miracle after miracle, and one day, out of sheer anger, he took that staff and he struck a rock, thinking that he alone and his own might could usher water to gush out of it, but it didn't work. Why? Because Moses had to learn the hard way that he was not God. And as a result of that act, he was forbidden by God to enter into that very same promised land. Take a look at David, that scrawny, wimpy-looking shepherd boy who had now become the mighty king of this great empire, over the years of his reign began to think of himself as kind of a big deal to the point where he thought he could do anything and have anything he wanted. And you know his story, right? committed adultery with Bathsheba. He ordered the murder of, his, of her wife and eventually one day started counting his troops as a symbolic way of taking a sense of his own power and his own magnificence. And in that moment, he started to feed his already overblown ego and he forgot that he was supposed to follow God and not try to become God. And then right here in today's scripture reading. That same ragtag group of disciples, look what they became. After three years of following Jesus, they started to think of themselves as a big deal to where one day they were having a conversation among themselves 
about who was the greatest among them. Who was second in command? Who was Jesus' MVP? Who was going to be vice Jesus in the new kingdom? And Jesus overheard that conversation and pretty much said to those disciples, you guys got to be kidding me. Do you remember at all who you were when I first found you? You see, the problem with most of us is either seeing, of our, seeing ourselves as either too unworthy to be of use of, to God or seeing ourselves too highly to be willing to be used by God. And there is a problem with both, and neither option has much use in the Christian life. There's a psychological principle here called enantiodromia, which I don't invite you to remember the word, just the principle of it, which is that any extreme eventually, over time, becomes the polar opposite extreme. In other words, this principle says that if you go too far in one direction, in the pursuit of one aspect of your personality or one priority in your life so one-dimensionally and so exclusively at the expense of every other aspect of your life, then you run the risk of eventually becoming the polar opposite of that very pursuit. A couple examples here. Think, first of all, of the person who singularly prioritizes the pursuit of wisdom and intellectual knowledge at the expense of every other aspect of their life. And so they study everything they can. They try to pursue every single intellectual pursuit they can. They try to amass degrees and diplomas and try to learn more and become more, thinking that they can become smarter than everybody else that they know. And that singular pursuit of wisdom actually makes them foolish in so many other aspects of their life. Can you intuitively see that possibility? Another example, think of a person who was so transfixed by the pursuit of power and prestige and authority and influence that they become singularly focused in that one pursuit of their life. They try to become bigger and better and more powerful than anybody else, thinking that everybody else is weaker than them. And inevitably, this principle of enantiodromia says that if you go singularly in that direction in the pursuit of power, you actually become weak and vulnerable and limited in many other aspects of your life. And that is what Jesus identifies in this conversation among the disciples. They had become so primarily transfixed by their own pursuit of greatness that Jesus realized they were actually becoming very weak and very vulnerable in the grand scheme of the pursuit of the kingdom. And so that's why Jesus names it, and He calls them on it, and says, you are becoming the opposite of what you need to be in the kingdom. If you become so highly inflated in your ego, you become so weak. So what is it that the principle of enantiodromia advises? It's quite simple. Balance. Don't become so singularly focused in one aspect of your life that you forget to tend to the other aspects of your life and your personality. In fact, it would go so far as to say that you need to embrace the shadow side of your life, to not be afraid to embrace those aspects of your life that you are so desperately running away from. In other words, let the person who is pursuing wisdom also embrace their own foolishness. Let the person who is embracing power and authority also embrace and acknowledge their weakness. Let the person who is fearful, trying to pursue courage, also embrace those things that they are afraid of. And Jesus said it this way, if you want to be first, you need to be last. If you want to gain your life, you need to lose your life. We are not here to be served, but Jesus said, I am here as one who serves. Jesus is very clear that if you want an antidote, if you want a counter mechanism to the problem of either seeing yourself too lowly or seeing yourself too highly, then try adopting a mindset and a pattern of servanthood. 
of offering yourself and the fullness of your capacities and facilities over to service to God and service to other people so that God can actually call you beyond yourself so that you can be drawn outside of your own being in help and in service to the world. In that way, God can prevent us from either seeing ourselves too lowly or too highly because God can use even us and because our usefulness is found only in God. Now imagine, imagine if you were able to discover that possibility in you. Imagine if you were able to yield yourself in surrender to God and in service to other people and use your gifts and passions and abilities in ways to transform lives and create Christian community and change the world, then imagine what can be unleashed in and through you. And that is what this card is all about. You know I was going to get to the card eventually, don't you? Sitting there right in your bulletin, it's made even bigger than the bulletin itself so you couldn't miss it. You know I was going to mention it. And I want you to know that this card that you now have in your hands is so much more than a blank for you to put your name on. It is so much more than a mechanism for you to put your name in a volunteer slot in a program or ministry in this church, although that is clearly a practical outcome that we hope for. You want to know what this primarily is? This is an invitation by God for you to find balance and wholeness in your life, for you to take the next step of your spiritual journey So that you who are having a problem seeing yourself as either too unworthy to be a servant or much too self-important to be a servant can find yourself unleashed for the purposes of the kingdom of God. I want you to notice there's something new on this card, something we've never put on a card like this before. There's a part at the very bottom of the front side under bullet point number three that says, I serve outside the church, and there's a little blank. We've never had that blank before. And you know what this is? This is a way for you to name and claim the ways that you are serving out there in the world, even beyond the ministries and programs of this church. That includes the ways that you are giving your hours and your energy to people like the PTA or the Junior League or the Music or Athletic Boosters or the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or Big Brothers or Guardian Ad Litem or Big Sisters or, or even simply caring for an elderly neighbor across the street or reading to kids in the library. You know why we're putting this on here? Because we believe the kingdom of God is bigger than the confines of this local church. And we believe that as Christians, we are called to go out there into the community to be ambassadors for Jesus, even beyond the auspices of this congregation. We hope that you'll also volunteer in and through the ministries of this church, but we recognize that God's at work out there, even in places that are not under the banner of Hyde Park United Methodist, and you are called to be a part of that too. So if you're involved in that, or ministries like that, or programs like that, we invite you to let us know. We want you to know that whatever you plan to do over this upcoming year, to be a servant in and through this church or out in the community, will be a way for you to discover something about yourself that you may not have ever recognized before. And if you want an example of that, we've got a family to introduce you this morning. Meet Adam and Vicki Kajanski, family in this church who discovered how God's love can be unleashed through them for the benefit of others and even for the benefit of their own family. Adam Kajanski. My name is Vicki Kajanski. You go first. Oh. <laughs> Volunteering and working here, I think, just in our everyday life, when they see when we're interacting with things like Vicki does uh, softball with the children, how they support other children, their peers, by the level of involvement in us being at church frequently for uh, Sunday school, coming to service, for Wednesday night Bible studies and things. 
they actually will talk about Christian values and inviting their friends to church. And tr you can see them helping out some of the other peers periodically when they're at their different events, be it Boy Scouts or softball or daisies, and how they interact with their friends on a regular basis. You can see that they're picking up and living out the values that the church is teaching them. Right, so um, one time my um, fifth grade son had a sleepover at our house with his best friend named Ethan. And, oh, it'll make me cry. <laughs> and I heard them talking in his room and he, um, I kind of snuck in there to see what they were talking about because it got quiet. And I found them both lying on the floor and Logan had his Bible open and they were reading them. <laughs> And they were reading the Bible together. And I took a bunch of pictures of it and I sent it to um, a lot of people, but I sent it to the children's ministry staff and I said, thank you for making this happen. Like, you know, um, just the staff has nurtured my ch children and given them the ability to see these gifts and to share with their kid, with their friends what I hope that they feel at our church and feel God's love inside of them. And that was a really special time, yeah, that we saw that play out. <laughs> we have a very busy life. Um, we both work and then we serve at church and we also do a lot of extracurricular activities with them. This is Lane and you want to introduce yourself? What grade? How old are you? Yeah. <laughs> she's she's Hello. she's seven Hi. years old and in first grade. Um, and she is Daisy. Brownie, Girl Scout, and um, I'm a co-leader for her troop, and also she plays softball, and I'm one of the coaches for her softball team. Okay, so, hello there. I am Logan. Okay. What grade are you in? I'm in fifth grade. I'm oh. a Boy Scout. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, obviously, with two little ones and school, things do get quite busy and work and volunteering and serving. I think with the church aspect especially, we make it a very deliberate part of our life to say that, okay, we are coming to church on Sunday. We, are, we have to teach this day. Um, on Wednesdays with group, we come because we say people are also counting on us to be in our group and be present. So that includes them to show up for Zone and Club 45. So it is a regular routine and it is a very deliberate thought process that we are going to be at church. It is something we want to do and instill in them that that is part of the routine, Sundays and Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. I think serving together for Adam and I has brought us closer together. And so that's a really positive outcome from serving just for our own, you know, selfishly for our own marriage and our own family. And the serving times too, it allows you to have a bunch of small wins throughout the day or the week um, to see a lot of positive aspects because there's so many things going on that we get inundated with in the news or social media. But when you come in and you serve, be it if you're serving um, breakfast at the Metropolitan Ministries or if you're doing um, VBS construction that we're working on now and you get to see the positive things and then the excitement from either somebody that you just provided that meal to or with the children at Vacation Bible School during that week, it really helps brighten up um, everyday life. Servanthood is the gateway to seeing ourselves realistically. Because Adam and Vicki Kajanski said yes to the invitation of the Spirit to allow God's love to be unleashed through them, I mean, you heard them say it. They looked at themselves in a completely new way. It strengthened their marriage. It brought them closer together as a family. It made them feel like they were part of something bigger than themselves, and they were able to see God's love made real in and through them. That kind of transformation is what fuels the energy of this place. It is our chief and utmost desire as leadership of this church that family after family and person after person experience the transformation that they have now borne witness to. And that's what makes this card so important. It's what makes all of the ministries happen in this church because people like them and people like you say yes to exploring what God can do in and through them. And that's why next week, 
I hope you'll come back with this card filled out, that there'll be a way for you to say yes to God using you, even if you don't quite know what that is yet. This card will be for you if you simply want to say, I don't know what God can do with me, but I want to explore it, and we'll follow up with you on that. Or it could be that you are very clear about how God is calling you to be in this church and through this church, and you want to list that in your card. Or it could be that you want to take it even one step further. It could be that God has given such an itch within your spirit that you want to say, I want to be a leader in this church. I want to be of leadership on a team or a ministry. I don't know what that is, but I really feel like God wants me to step up my faith journey and be in leadership in this church. And if that's what you're asking, then this is a timely time for you to ask that because next Sunday after church, there's an event called Leadership Door, a very warm and invitational 90-minute period for you to say, I want to lead and I want to explore how God can use me. And if you're interested in that, just mark that on your connection card. I'm interested in leadership door. I hope that all of us will respond to this because this is not a pitch from me. This is not a pitch from Hyde Park United Methodist. This is evidence of how the Spirit always works, calling people time and again throughout the entire history of the Bible who either see themselves as much too insignificant or much too self-important to be a servant of the Most High. And it is our prayer that next Sunday when we come together to celebrate all of these commitments, we'll be able to say that we are not here to be served, but like Jesus, we are ones who are here to serve. Let us pray together. God, we thank You for the model and example of Jesus who gave Himself to us and for the world. He who was Himself fully divine embraced humility, embraced the shadow side of His own humanity so that through Him You could transform the world. You have called us to live in that example and to bear the mind of Christ and so therefore to give of ourselves freely and willingly as servants of Yours. Teach us, O God, in these days to be so open to our surrender to You that You might unleash Your work through us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and let all God's people say, Amen. So we invite Your response in the form of God's tithes and Your gifts and Your offerings through the connection cards that contain your questions and your prayer concerns, and perhaps you've already filled out your Say Yes card. We will receive those from you today or throughout the week. At this time, we invite the ushers to come forward and wait upon us.